Amen. You can be seated. 2023. Wow. You know what that means? I'm old. Amen. So there you go. <laughs> Man, I, I am. I, I, told, I told my wife, next year I will celebrate my 40th uh, class reunion. <laughs> I'm like, man, am I old. Uh, I always, there's something special to me about, um, about a new beginning, about new years, a new, a new leash on life. Um, and uh, I, this, this year, normally I have, I have a great message that I'm all ready to give at the new year. A new, and this year, man, I struggled. I gotta be honest with you, man. I was I was like, come on, God. Like it's New Year. I gotta have something. You can't just you can't just leave me hanging here. And uh I I come in here, I, I I spent time on this altar. I'm just going, God, what is it that you want me to say? And and I'm like getting I'm getting nothing. So I do what I, I normally do. I d I don't know. Uh I don't know what, what other pastors do whenever they get that block. Uh, we got two two old pastors here. Probably ask them what they do, but I just started listening to to other people's sermons. I'm going, God, I I need something, man. You got to give me something. And and I I was listening to to Steve Furtrick, and I don't know if I'm saying his name right or wrong. Probably pronouncing it wrong. And uh, he brought up this passage out of Leviticus. I'm like Leviticus. Like I tell people, like. But just push through, brother. Just push through. Like, you, Genesis, got it. Great, great story. All kinds of cool stuff. Exodus, man, they're leaving. All kinds. Leviticus. Whew. Dear God, why did you put Leviticus in the Bible? <laughs> and, then, and then, to make matters worse, your next one is Numbers. And then you finally get to Deuteronomy, and you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. You're, you're alive again. And, and it's Exodus, last call, and then we get into to Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel. It's all good stuff, man. Then, then I, I'm, we're on board now. Now it's, now it's going great. But Leviticus, the law. Like, really? The law. Leviticus 26, 10. And, and when I read it, I, it just hit me. I was like, man, that's it. Make room for the new. You got to make room for the new. I was like, wow, that's, that's in my life. I hope it's in yours. I hope in 2023, you'll kind of clean out some old to make room for the new. That requires change, right? And, and I titled this, this uh, message, Change Doesn't Just Happen. You don't wake up and, and be you know, 60 pounds lighter. <laughs> you don't wake up and run a marathon. You don't wake up and, and, and do what you couldn't do before. It takes an effort to change. And that's really what I felt like God really laid on my heart for Christ's way. He said, I'm going to do something new at Christ's way. But you got to make room for the change. That's hard. It was funny because just, just the other night I was, I was talking to uh, another one of our Steves <laughs> that was here. And he was talking about all the change that, that Steve Bryce had brought into Christ's way. Like, you know, hiding the hymnals and doing all kinds of other stuff that he did uh, to, to bring apart the change that God was calling the church to. And I, I, I was like, wow, how, how fitting in Isaiah 43, 19, it says, Behold, I'm doing something new, and I will make a way. In Revelation 21, 5, it says, Behold, I'm making all things new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. It seems that whether we're in the Old Testament or we're in the New Testament, God is always up to doing something new. The tension between holding on to what is old and releasing enough to bring in what is new is hard. 
It's hard for all of us. It's hard to, to give up what's comfortable and move in. And then, and then you got the culture. The culture is shifting so fast, and we're, we're, we're holding on, saying, man, don't, don't go with that wave. That wave is crazy right now. You know, so that there's that tension of that too, and and it's shifting faster than I think I've ever seen it in the history of our nation. And one thing you can't release is biblical truth. If the Bible says it's true, it's true. You can't compromise just because it makes you feel better, just because the society is saying this is. You can't compromise if it's if it's true in the Bible. It is true. What God says is true, and what God says is right now under attack from everywhere. It's on everything. It's in our colleges. It's in our society. It's in our TikToks, in our YouTubes, in our everything that we're putting in front of our kids is all going against the wave. It's going against biblical values. And if we're not careful, we'll start believing that's true and not the Bible. And when that happens, look out. Because the last days are upon us. When I was, uh, when I was working uh, in the secular world, I worked for a, a company called Corbett Manufacturing. And Tom Rhodes uh, had us read a book called uh, Who Moved My Cheese? I don't, I don't mean to bring back nightmares to those of you who had to go through the, the studies that I did with our corporate of who moves my cheese. But I started thinking about this whenever I thought about that. When God laid this message on my mind, this book came back to me. Evidently, he, he, we, pushed, we had to all sign it. I don't know if you've ever worked for a company like that. He had all these books that would help us to become better. And after you read it, you signed it, said you read it, and then you put, passed it along to the next executive and he had to read it but this book uh, who moved my cheese about two mice right stiff and scurry and two little people him and ham stiff and scurry were quick to change and him and ham were a little bit hesitant matter of fact uh, they were real resistant to change they all found cheese at cheese station c and they got so used to just going down to, to see, and the cheese was there. So they just, every day, they would, they would go. Him and Ham, of course, they, they got up right, or Scurry, I'm sorry, Scurry and Sniff got up really quick in the morning, and they took off, and they ran to the cheese. They were there early. They noticed when the cheese was beginning to disappear. Him and Ham, not so much. They got pretty complacent. They got pretty comfortable. Every day, they went there, and the cheese was there. Until it wasn't. And when it wasn't, they, they had to figure out, what are we going to do? There's, there's no cheese. And they, and they at first, they just kept going back and finding nothing. And then after a while, they had to, to go. And, and one of them finally, I don't remember who it was, but one of them finally, I think it was him, decides that, you know, I'll go off. I'll, I'll accept the change. And I'll go find, and he goes and finds cheese and Ham never does, or haw, ham, whoever. He never finds out that, that he never leaves. He, he resists it all the way to his own demise. It, it's, it's interesting how we can do that as a church. How we can get so caught up in what we do that we miss the change that needs to occur. I don't know what that is. Like, I wish I could give you a, a blueprint and say, okay, we're going to do this, 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 this. I don't know. I just know things are changing. And God is changing, and he's moving in a new way. And we've got to make room for that as God lays that and moves us forward. So in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 9 through 11, it says this, I will turn, you, I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat old stored, long kept, and you shall... Clear out old to make way for the new. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not arbor you. I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. I will turn to you and make you fruitful 
and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. I read that and I said, yes, Lord. Multiply us. Lord, you, you have given us promises in the past and I'm, I, I want to grab a hold of that. And I want to believe that, God. I want to believe if we're faithful to you, if we stay solid in your covenant, that you will bless us. I don't want to compromise. I don't want to walk away from that. But I, but I want to be willing to go in a new way, if that's what you call us to do. I want to make room for you to move. His covenant with the Israel people was that they would be fruitful and they would multiply and he had land for them and he, had, uh, he was going to be their God and he was going to be with them and he was going to lead them into the promised land. He says, I'm, I'm not abandoning that, but get ready for something new. And when they crossed the border, it was new. Life had changed completely. They were no longer, they come out of this, this time of slavery, this time that they were stuck in and God began to transform them. Sometimes to change, we think we have to need, completely get rid of everything that was old, everything in the past. You know, the older I get, it's kind of weird. I used to sit in church and we would have the hymnal and I would sing it and I'd go, ah, 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 ah. you know what I mean? And, and now that I'm older, I'm going, man, I kind of like those old hymns. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to them. They're kind of remade now in the, in the music. And I'm going, wow, that was, that was I miss that, man. Like I, I'll hear, you know, the old rugged cross or something. I'm like, oh, it brings me back. Brings me back to a, to a time. <laughs> and I'm no longer going, uh, I'm, I'm kind of singing along with it now. Many churches um, are doing things that, that the Bible says should not be done. And we've got, we've got to be careful. Change is good as long as it's biblical. It's not good if it just pleases the masses. God never told us to please the masses. He never told us to compromise on, on our biblical values to accept the current norm or the culture around us just because people have feelings that it's the right thing to do or, or this is right or they take the Bible out of context. The Bible warns us about this in Matthew 24, doesn't it? He says, in the last days, in the last days, many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. We're seeing that play out in our culture, even in the churches today. So when we get ready to clear out the old, we must remember not what is important, what is absolute true, and what's junk. We all got junk in our closets, don't we? Well, okay, just me. In my closet, I have clothes that I will never fit into. I, ha I, have, I, have, I have things hung up on my on my inside my closet that every time I pass by it, I'm going, I'm not going to wear that. Why is it in my closet? I don't know, but it's there. And, and I have to push the clothes I want out of the way to get to the one I want. We all have these things that, that, that just don't matter in us. And he says you have to clear out the old to make sure, make way for the new. Uh, I'm not sure how Things are organized around your house. But we have a spare bedroom. Now, some of you, just by your reaction, are organized like our house. And our kids came home <laughs> for, uh, for Christmas. To which we had to make it a bedroom again. <laughs> Instead of a massive storage closet. <laughs> So we had to move. We had to move out a lot to make way for our kids to come home. I think in our lives, we have a lot of junk that we need to move out of the way. We got to get rid of so that we can make way or make room for that which is new. Today's New Year's Day. Many Americans will make New Year's resolutions to get in shape, to remodel, to eat better, to get out of more 
to make new friends, to, to get back in contact with old friends. We even make religious uh, resolutions, don't we? Oh, I'm going to read the book this year. I'm going to go. I, by the way, I helped my class out. I started them out. We read Genesis chapter 1 and 2 today. In, in my, so they're, 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 they're ahead of you all. <laughs> Just letting you know. So, uh, but we say, man, I'm going I'm to make it through the Bible this year. I'm going I'm to increase my prayer life. Man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get more involved. I'm going to fill in the blank. There you go. <laughs> you and Steve. <laughs> you, you, you guys have a partnership. I see a Bible study starting. Anyway, <laughs> but we, we need to. We need to do it the right way, don't we? We can't just jump into things without taking care of other things. See, change just doesn't help, just doesn't happen. It's going to require some work. It's going to require some effort. Everybody goes to the gym in January. <laughs> and everybody makes a deposit to the gym in February. <laughs> Like we, we, we sign up for this year-long membership and we get our first month. <laughs> We're doing good. We bought an exercise bike. We've all ridden it once. We're starting the new year, starting the new year off right. We become, but it isn't long before we become comfortable, complacent, and content. Comfortable complacent and content and our great ideals our great expectations our great for the new year falls away and kind of just cast to the side so in this new year if we're going to do what God wants us to do we're going to have to to get ready for it if we're going to change we got to choose to change. You get, you're not just going to change. You have to choose. And you, you got to be dedicated about it. You can't just do it. Um, in Acts chapter 15, one of the biggest changes, I think, that, that, was, that was, uh, happened, at least in the Jewish face at that time, it, it happens, uh, Acts 11 chapter 5 says this, I was in the city of Joppa praying. I'm going to stop there just for a second. I was in the city of Joppa praying. If you want to start your new life and you want to get closer to God, that's a good place to start. I was in Joppa praying. Joppa. Joppa. Joppa, Joppa, Joppa. What a great place. You know that's scattered all throughout the Bible? There is great change that happens in Joppa. In Joppa, that's where, that's where Jonah <laughs> left to go to Tarshish. He, was, he, was in, he left from Joppa and, you know, run away from God. It was in Joppa that um, Solomon had the, the timber, the cedar, to build the temple. It's in Joppa that Peter is at whenever, whenever he heals Dorcas. <laughs> My kids always love that name, Dorcas. Like her name, you know, it translated Tabitha, but everybody likes Dorcas. Uh, but she, she was a woman. She was a disciple. And the Bible says that she was full of good works, acts, and charity. She had died. They washed her. They put her in the up, upper room. And they tell Peter about it. Peter goes in. He goes in the upper room. He says, Tabitha, get up. And she got up. Man, this same dude that just denied Christ three times, this guy who didn't have the faith to even uh, say who Christ was has been filled with the Holy Spirit, has preached the sermon that many have come to know Christ. He, had already, he has seen the healing power of God, and now he does what he saw Jesus do to his own mother-in-law. Do you remember that? He walked in there, she was sick, and he says, get up. She got up and started serving him. He walks in there and he says, get up. Come on, Tabitha. She looks at him and she gets up. Comes back to life. 
power. He had received, he'd seen how God had changed things. Joppa, Joppa, Joppa. Three times it, it, it talks in this passage about Joppa. I, I want to go to Joppa. <laughs> I mean, good things happen in Joppa. Joppa is a place of preparation of change. Joppa is a place where you can run away from change. Joppa is a place where you can embrace change. Joppa is a place where you have to make a decision of what you're going to do. You're going to either embrace it, you're going to run away from it, or you're going to prepare for it. But Joppa is a decision place. It's that decision point of what are you going to do? How are you going to find your cheese? <laughs> are you going to go for it? Joppa. Acts 11, 5 through 18. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance, and I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. Four corners. By the way, that represents the four corners of the world. In other words, he's having a vision of the entire world. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey, reptiles, birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill, eat. But I said, Oh, but no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven and said, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up into the heavens. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house which were sent from Sisera. And the Spirit told me to go with them. Make no distinction. That's an interesting phrase. You see, the Jews believed that the only people who could really worship God was the Jews. They believed that they were the chosen people and the, and the Gentiles we're not part of the covenant. And this is, I've heard this preached many times about this is why we can eat bacon and, and ham. This has nothing to do with bacon and ham, although I like them both. This has everything to do with the acceptance of that which was not acceptable before, the Gentiles, and bringing them in to the covenant with God. He goes on, these six brothers also accomplished me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa, there it is, and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just had it done to us in the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you, you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. If then God gives the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I would stand up against God? When... They heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Praise God. We're here today because this very thing, because he says God has brought us in to the Bible. Acts 10 says, What God has made clean, do not call common. Now, guys, he's not talking about, about the animals. He's talking about us. He's talking about the people in the world. That God loves all people and treats all people the same. I, I love, I, in, in, to steal this from Frederick's sermon, he said this. He says, just remember, when you don't want someone in the church because they offend you, if it were not for Jesus, you wouldn't be here either. Amen. That's a pretty powerful statement. I had to write that down. If it wasn't for Jesus, you wouldn't be here either. We, we, it would just be the Jewish synagogue. But Jesus brought us in. Change is hard. It is hard. Verse 17 says, If God gave the same gifts to them as he gave to us when we believed 
in Jesus Christ. Who was I that I could stand in God's way? Man, oh man, how many times have we stood in God's way? My way, not thy way, <laughs> be done. We, God has wanted to give us a blessing. God has wanted to work with us. So many times we've been like Jonah. Instead of doing what God called us to do, we left Joppa on the boat and ran away from what he called us to do. And we missed the blessing. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to end up in the belly of a well. I'm not even a seafood fan. <laughs> I could not even imagine what that smelled like. <laughs> I, I am hypersensitive to smell, and I don't think I would care for that much at all. And to be spit out on the shore, I mean, none of that sounds good to me at all. I would rather just go and do God's will <laughs> instead of go against it and end up like Jonah did. Change is hard, though. It is extremely hard. I believe, and this is my heart, and I want to talk to you about it, I believe the biggest change that we need to make is really going to reflect the family. I believe if there's one place, one place in society that Satan is attacking, it is the family. I believe he's destroying the family, he's destroying everything about it, and we are reaping the consequences of the family being absolutely dispersed. I see it every day. Every day I'm, that I work at Barnes, I see the repercussions of the breakdown of the family. I, I have to deal with shootings. I have to deal with just all kinds of horrific things that people are doing that I would never dream. We, we, have, we have allowed the family be, to be taken over by culture. We have redefined marriage. We have redefined marriage. The Bible says... Marriage is between a husband and a wife. Jesus even said it. Like, if you don't want to go Old Testament, I can go New Testament on you. Jesus defined it. That's what marriage is. You want to, you want to go do sin, go do sin, but don't, don't call it marriage. Because God already defined that. We have allowed children whose brains are not even mature. Little kids to make life-altering decisions about their body. As a child. Man, I don't want to tell you what my brain was like when I was a kid. There's no telling what I would be. But we're allowing this in the society. Some of this stuff just boggles my mind of the road that we're, we're going down. We, we have protests celebrating the death of a baby instead of celebrating the adoption of a baby. It's crazy where society has went. It all comes down to the breakdown of the family. There's no moral structure within the family anymore. That's why I am so avid about our family program on Sunday night. I believe that God is going to do that. We're going to teach parents how to teach children about God. Because we've lost it somewhere along the way. And it was my generation that did it. It's my generation that sent kids to church instead of took them to church. It's my generation that left the church. It's, it's, it's our generation that got us where we are. Why are kids shooting other kids in St. Louis and, and New Orleans and, and feeling no remorse? The values of this nation seem to be deteriorating every day. Kids don't respect their elders. Why children, they're making decisions that they should never be allowed to make. It all comes down to the breakdown of the family. That's where it is. We like to blame everything from the internet to school systems to you name it. But guess what? Values are taught at home. If it ain't happening at home, it ain't going to happen anywhere. It's the church's responsibility also to pick up that slack. To step in to the void. And I believe that's where we need to make room. God has entrusted us with the most precious gift of all. We talked about it in our class. You're made in God's image. 
You are God's workmanship. God has entrusted us with his greatest creation. We have a generation of young adults that raise themselves. We have a generation of young people that are being raised by TikTok, YouTube, and every other social media pattern in the world. And you have no idea who that person is telling your kid what reality is. We, that's why the church and the family program is so important. We cannot just sit back and allow the social media, the talking heads, the morality that's out there somewhere that is infiltrating our children to be the only voice they hear. It's up to the church to teach biblical worldview, how we see the world as it applies to the Bible. That's the slack. That's where we need to go. The one area Satan is winning the battle like never before is the family. And that's the exact place that I believe that God needs this church to fight back against. We need to be a pillar that helps the family to grow and to have biblical values. The third thing that I have, and this is my last point, so change requires perseverance. Boy, that's the hard thing. I'm telling you, perseverance to keep going, even when it's hard to keep going. Uh, Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says, Not that I have already obtained or I aim am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brother, I do not consider that I already made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I press forward toward the go. It's, it's in a way that he says I use every ounce of my strength to go toward where God's called me to go. I press toward the go for the prize of the upper calling of Jesus Christ. It's hard to believe for me. I'm looking at myself. Hard to believe four years ago, I'd never rode a bike but around a block. Four years ago, I, ran, I rode a bike 500 miles in four days. Four years ago, <laughs> I, I can't believe, three years ago, I completed an 18.64 ruck march. 18.64 mile ruck march in under two hours. With a, with a 25 pound ruck. Two years ago, I ran my first marathon in just a little over two hours, half marathon. Let me get that right. <laughs> and that year, I also went from 225 pounds to 175 pounds, to which I'm not anymore. <laughs> but I just didn't wake up and do it. None of that did I wake up and do. I had to practice. I had to train my body. I had to make it so that I could do that. You, you don't just wake up and, and ride a bike 500 miles. You just don't wake up and ruck over 18 miles. You just don't wake up and run a half marathon. It just doesn't happen. I trained every day for those events. I put off old habits. I strained ahead toward the goal. It was never easy, and there was plenty of times I just wanted to quit and give it up and say it wasn't worth it. 400 miles into a bike ride, I had a bad crash. I still have the scars from that crash. I, it was so bad that I had to get a new helmet because, thank goodness, my head broke my fall. Um, <laughs> if my, my, my forks bent on my bike, it crashed so bad. They had to go to a bike shop and give me somebody else's bike to finish the ride. But I pressed on. I could have quit. But I pressed on. I remember when I was running the I remember when I was running the the or doing the ruck march. Ten miles into it, my calves hurt so bad I couldn't run anymore. You have to run walk because it's a fifteen it's a fifteen minute pace and try I, you can't just walk fifteen minutes with a ruck. So you have to run and walk and my calves just I couldn't run. I, I literally could not run. They they just cramped up so bad. And I had in my mind that I was just going to quit. 
I, I lived in a, a certain area, you know, and I said, well, I'll just make it to there. I'm going in my room. I'll take this thing off. I'm not walking across that, that line in defeat. <laughs> I'm just not doing it. I'm never going to make the time. And as I got up to where I lived, I could see the finish line. Changed everything. I said, I'm going to make this. I'm going to do this. And I started pushing my body to make it. And I, I crossed the finish line in time. Um, running the half marathon. Man, before I started running the half marathon, I could barely do two miles, which is pretty good. I mean, for my age, I can run two miles, but that's about it. I started running every day, just increasing a little bit, increasing a little bit. I'll never forget, in Indianapolis, I'm running along, I'm looking at my watch, and, you know, I'm doing great. And I hit 10 miles. And I was just ready to go home. (laughs) I was done. And there's people, now everybody that I passed is now passing me because I'm just barely going. And I looked down and I said, man, there's only a few more miles left. I'll never be this close to doing it. And I kept going. I pushed on. I made it. You know, I say all this. uh, Man, losing all that weight, I got down to 190 pounds. I said, man, I've never been down 190 pounds in years. I'm good. But I kept going because I had a goal. And I kept pushing myself toward that goal. (laughs) And because of that, so I received a nice medal when I crossed the finish line after the half marathon. It's at my house. It's probably the only one I'll ever get. The Norwegian Ruck March, I wear a badge now on my uniform where I made it. At 54, I was passing all the old, young kids that didn't make it. I have a little badge that I wear at the Norwegian Ruck March. Yeah, in, Af- in Afghanistan, <laughs> um, we lost... Uh, soldiers, and that was the Gold Star 500 that I rode that bike, and I'll never forget, um, in my life, I had struggled with some stuff, you know, you just struggle with some stuff when you, when, you, when you go through war, and I will never forget, when we finished that 500, there was uh, this, uh, this trailer that had all the pictures of the soldiers on it um, that we had lost. And everybody was up doing the everybody was up doing the the presentation, you know, and everything. And I was I was me in the trailer. And there was such closure that happened in the midst of the pain, in the midst of everything. I looked at those faces, and I was able to just pray over that. And there was something that released from me that I had been holding in me. Had I not pushed through, had I not got up after I crashed, I would have never found that peace. I would never receive the prize. I learned a long time ago on the KG Pass in Afghanistan. When we come under fire, I remember listening. We all wear headphones. I remember listening. They said, push through, push through, push through. Don't stop. Push through. If we push through, we're all dead. Push through, push through. And no matter how much we wanted to stop and fight, no matter how much you wanted to turn around, you had to keep going. You had to push through. If you didn't push through, it it, it could mean the end of everything. And we pushed through, even when it was hard. That still resonates with me. Push through. Whatever it is, push through. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made it his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have already made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper calling of Christ Jesus, my Lord. To achieve all that God is calling us as a church and as individuals to do in 2023, we need to forget what lies behind and press on to what lies ahead. Yesterday ended last night. And today is a brand new year full of possibilities. There is nothing impossible with God. Nothing. God just wants us to be faithful. And he wants us to push through. Push through. Keep going. 
Don't give up. Keep your eyes on the cross. Don't take them off. Don't let society change your viewpoint. Keep your eyes where they need to be fixed on Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you now. And Lord, I just pray for this church. I pray for us. Father God, give us the wisdom to know how we're supposed to handle this battle that lays ahead of us. Father God, the the families are being destroyed. The young people, um, they need hope. They need you. And Father, some of the old stuff that we've made into things, that needs to disappear. For you're making all things new. Father God, help us to understand what we need to remove so there's room for that which you're making new. And Father God, I ask that in my life and others. Lord, remove whatever it is that's old. That's been the barrier between our faith walk, between us and you. Whatever that is, Father God, remove that so that you can put something new inside each one of us. And we just pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Please join us and please stand and join us for one last song this morning.
and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above. 